This video is about three-dimensional computer-aided vision using the anaglyphic method. In this economical method, you wear glasses with red and cyan color filters to direct binocular images to your left and right eyes. It's very simple. You put on the glasses and you see three dimensions. But why am I showing off this simple, cheap 3D vision method instead of the fancy new virtual reality goggles that are becoming available? To answer, I need to reveal some history. In 2010, Palmer Lucky created a prototype of the Oculus Rift in his parents' garage in Long Beach, California. By 2012, Lucky had started a company called Oculus VR and began shipping consumer-ready devices. Then, in an excruciatingly bad business decision, Mr. Lucky sold his company to Facebook after assuring his loyal supporters that A, Oculus buyers would not have to acquire a Facebook account, and B, the Oculus headset would not become an advertising delivery device. But, surprise, surprise, Facebook didn't see things that way. After closing the deal, Facebook imposed the requirement that Oculus purchasers must have a Facebook account. Now they're planning in-viewer advertising for the Oculus devices, describing themselves as, and I quote, excited by the opportunity to open up new revenue streams, unquote. When I read quotes like this, I wonder whether these creatures know how they sound to human ears. When I first heard about Mr. Lucky's plan to sell his company to Facebook, I and many others could see what was coming, but perhaps surprisingly, Lucky had no idea. Too young and inexperienced, I guess. But for people who expect to have some measure of control over their lives, who refuse to be someone's involuntary product, any association with Facebook is out of the question. Therefore, so is Oculus. In a perfect world, people would boycott both Facebook and Oculus, Facebook's new three-dimensional advertising organ. Okay, let me explain how this 3D method works. The basic idea of human binocular vision is that we have two eyes and each eye has a slightly different view of the world. Our brains process the two views and interpret the difference between them as depth information. It turns out we can provide our eyes with artificially created images and get the same 3D effect we get from nature. In the anaglyphic method, the left image is red and the right image is cyan, which means blue-green. For properly designed glasses, none of the red color passes through the cyan lens and none of the cyan color passes through the red lens, so the glasses provide our eyes with the correct images for a 3D effect. To create a 3D image, first you take two pictures at slightly different positions, imitating the position of our eyes. For this example, I used a quadcopter. I snapped a picture, then moved the drone horizontally and snapped another picture. Then you create red and cyan versions of the two original images. Then you combine the red and cyan images into one anaglyphic image that can be viewed with red cyan glasses. All the technical details are linked in this video's description. If you think about it, you realize that the final anaglyphic image retains all the color and detail of the two original images but in a way that directs all the red colors to the viewer's left eye and all the green and blue colors to the right. So the original image is intact, but converted to three dimensions. I've been working on a solar system model using the Blender graphics program and the Python computer language. In this model, I set up a planetary flyby gravity assist in which a spacecraft gets a velocity boost by passing close to Jupiter. In theory, you can get a 60% velocity boost if the approach is set up correctly. Here's a large-scale view of the spacecraft launch and Jupiter flyby. Unfortunately, in this view, you can't see much detail of the planetary encounter. Also, just to make things easy to see, the Sun, planets, and spacecraft aren't to scale. Here's a close-up of the Jupiter flyby. Notice how much velocity the spacecraft acquires as it passes the biggest planet in the solar system. This free velocity boost lets the craft achieve its mission without needing extra fuel. But you know what? It turns out if you launch the spacecraft from Earth only three hours late, then 200 days later, the spacecraft passes on the wrong side of Jupiter and loses most of its original velocity. 
Then, instead of departing on its intended mission, the spacecraft enters a highly elliptical orbit around the Sun. I think that counts as a mission failure. This kind of computer modeling is how NASA and other agencies plan space missions because of something called the three-body problem. It turns out that any orbital problem with more than two bodies must be modeled just like this on a computer with many tests and adjustments. And this 3D rendering method helps people visualize outcomes and plan successful missions. Particle Box is a virtual physics experiment that models a set of bouncing particles. It's available as a web page, link in the description. Visiting the web page is a better experience because you can make all kinds of changes and see what happens interactively. This section will show you what the Particle Box does and maybe it's easy to visit the web page. In this first experiment, the particles bounce around in the box unaffected by gravity, like being out in orbit or in space. The restitution value is 1. Restitution means how much of a particle's energy is returned after a bounce. A value of 1 means no energy loss. Now the box has normal Earth gravity. The particles fall to the bottom and bounce. The restitution value is still 1, so the particles don't lose any energy when they bounce. Notice the energy level shown at the lower left. It should be nearly constant. Now the restitution value is 0 0.9, meaning a particle loses 10% of its energy on each bounce. This is more like real life, because almost no bounces are perfectly elastic in reality. The particles gradually lose all their energy. The restitution value is now 1.1, meaning the particles gain 10% energy on each bounce. This is like a boiling kettle over a flame. The energy level increases over time. Imagine that the particles are water molecules inside a tea kettle acquiring an energy by colliding with the walls. And boom! My simulator crashes with infinite energy. My program can't continue if the computed energy gets to infinity. Remember that infinity is not a number, it's an idea. Here are 500 particles, 10 times more than before, floating around in zero gravity. This high particle count lets you see more complex parts of the simulation, like any wave effects that might change groups of particles in a distinctive way. Here, the restitution value is set to zero, which means if a particle strikes a wall, it loses all its energy and becomes stuck. Remember that each dimension in the box, left, right, up, down, and farther closer, have a separate energy that is lost in a collision. Here, all 500 particles bounce at once under normal Earth gravity, and particles lose 10% of their energy on each bounce. Notice the wave patterns visible in groups of particles that respond to the gravitational field in different ways. Again, Particle Box is available as a web page with interactive controls. Link in the description. You can run your own experiments and choose combinations of parameters I haven't thought of. I've always thought a direct one-on-one -on -one interaction is more educational, as well as more fun, than watching a video. A little philosophical digression, if you don't mind. Inexpensive computers are making physics experimentation and mathematics much more productive. Calculus in particular is much easier to understand and use because computers help us visualize and interact with our experiments. This particle box is an example. It numerically solves a differential equation in three dimensions for each particle in a realistic way and lets you change the rules in a flash. Young people may be able to take computer power for granted, but I remember designing equipment for the NASA Space Shuttle only a few decades ago at a time when getting a mathematical result meant using a slide rule or pencil and paper and running a physics experiment meant building a physical device to see what would happen. My Jupiter flyby simulation earlier in this video is an example. 70 years ago it wouldn't have been possible at all, and 50 years ago it would only have been possible on one of the few available computers powerful enough to process the model. Now it can be carried out on an ordinary personal computer. In this section, I want to show how my orbital physics engine can experimentally demonstrate conservation of energy. There's a rule in physics that energy is conserved. It's never created nor destroyed, only changed in form. A planetary orbit has two kinds of energy. 
the kinetic energy of motion, and the potential energy of position or state. We find an orbiting body's kinetic energy by measuring its velocity, and its potential energy by measuring how distant it is from the object it's orbiting, and a few other properties. I resisted the impulse to provide a full mathematical derivation here, in this video that's supposed to be about anaglyphic 3D, so instead I'll put a link to one of my articles in this video's description. Suffice it to say that a planetary orbit, however extreme, should not gain or lose energy over time, and the sum of kinetic and potential energy should equal a constant. Using the Blender graphics program in my own Python code, I set up a model with an extreme elliptical orbit, chosen so the relationship between kinetic and potential energy would constantly change as the planet moves. Then at each point in the orbit, I recorded the two kinds of energy and added them together. After some refinements and tuning, my numerical model confirms energy conservation to eight decimal places. In the lower left of the display are two changing numbers, kinetic and potential energy, and a third number, which is the unchanging sum of the energies. This was a fun project and a useful result. In this section, I want to discuss some of the limitations and workarounds for the anaglyphic method. When I started choosing pictures for use with this method, I assumed they would all need to be drained of their original colors, made entirely monochromatic, so the special red cyan color keying would work as it should. But I soon discovered some colors would work and wouldn't spoil the 3D effect, as long as they weren't too bright or too near either the red or blue ends of the spectrum. And again, a full technical rundown and detailed methods are linked in this video's description. This house picture came out rather well, considering that I just processed the picture without thinking about the image's colors. It turns out the colors are all muted, not saturated or extreme, and none of them approach too closely to the red or blue end of the spectrum, so the image works well in 3D with its original colors. This Blender chessboard animation also came out well, even though it has aesthetically pleasing colors. I chose the colors to make the image look like a traditional wooden chessboard, but as it turns out, and by chance, those colors didn't interfere with the 3D effect. In my experience, this color issue tends to rely on chance factors. Some images will have colors that interfere with the 3D effect, some won't, and the easiest way to know is to create an anaglyphic image and try it out. You can reduce the color saturation present in some pictures to avoid problems, but the ultimate remedy for problem images is to remove all the colors. I'd like to bring up one more issue. When you buy anaglyphic glasses, make sure they're red cyan, not red blue. It turns out you can often tell which color filters are being used by going online and looking at the picture of what you're ordering. Red cyan glasses are technically the right choice because the resulting image is brighter as well as being color balanced. A monochrome anaglyph should appear grayscale, not purple. The existence and sale of red-blue glasses for anaglyphic use only reveals that someone doesn't understand how this method works. In keeping with tradition, at this point in my videos, I tell one joke from my secret archive of pretty good jokes. Here goes! The international unit of female beauty is the millihelen. It takes one millihelen to launch one ship. <laughs> I hope you found this video entertaining and educational. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe to help others discover it.